Good, good afternoon to everybody. We are very happy to be here, uh, Professor Giacca from uh, ICGB. Uh, Professor Giacca is a very renowned uh, scientist. I will read now some uh, brief note about his uh, uh, scientific biography. But he's also a scientist uh, who is collaborating with CISA and uh, we are working together in order to improve and to strengthen the collaboration between CISA and uh, his group of research and also other researchers at the University of Trieste and Udine. The subject uh, of the today uh, talk is the colloquium uh, is uh, really interesting. It's something that involves all of us, whatever is uh, our field of interest and uh, uh, the fact that so many people are here today is a response to the interest uh, to this subject. Professor Giacca obtained his degrees in medicine in 84 from the University of Trieste uh, and uh, uh, obtained the, the PhD in microbiology in 89 from the University of Genoa. Since 2004, is the director of the Trieste component of the International Center of Genetic Engineering and biotechnology, ICGB, as I said, where he has been the group leader of the Molecular Medicine Laboratory since 1995. From 2000 to 2005, he has been Associate Professor of Molecular Biology at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa and Director of the Molecular Biology Laboratory in the same institution. Since 2005, he is full Professor of Molecular Biology at the University of Trieste. His research is focused on the development of novel biotherapeutics for cardiovascular disorders. He also maintains a strong interest in the molecular biology of HIV-1 infec infection. Research activity is funded through grants from various public and private bodies, including the European Research Council, he obtained an ERC Advanced Investigator Grant, uh, the Italian Ministry of Education Research, the World Anti-Doping Agency, uh, the GDRF in the United States, and the Teleton Foundation in Italy, among the others. He has published over 240 papers in peer-reviewed international journals and 20 reviews and chapters in published books and university textbooks. He is author of the book Gene Therapy, edited by Springer. He regularly presents his research activity at meetings and seminars worldwide. Uh, I have to add that he organizes uh, a lot of uh, meetings uh, here in Trieste, also for generic public, and uh, is very active in outreach. And I thank also the people that wrote for me these notes, because they didn't know all things about you. <laughs> but next time they have to write larger, because I'm old, <laughs> and otherwise <laughs> I have difficulty reading. So please, I'll start your thank talk. You. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I think I already have two, so <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Martinelli. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for, for attending. It's really a, a great pleasure. Uh, a uh, great pleasure being here, and uh, I, I understand that these colloquia are not speci specifically meant for people uh, who are deeply involved uh, in uh, the field of, uh, of research uh, uh, of the speaker, but are broadly involved uh, in, in, uh, in interesting topics uh, in uh, different fields of science. And so when I was proposed to come here, I was very happy, and then I, I, I decided I wanted uh, to propose a, a, a topic that I find really fascinating. I've been following uh, all over the years. And I find it fascinating uh, um, uh, for science, and I find it uh, fascinating for, for personal reasons. And I, I think that uh, everybody belonging to the human species uh, and uh, to uh, any living species on, on the planet should be interested in this topic because this relates uh, to the life expectancy and uh, aging. So what I will do today is just to take you through what's known in terms of genetics and molecular biology of, of aging uh, and uh, try to convince you that really this is something 
absolutely uh, unique. I start with these slides here because it reports a very interesting uh, sentence. Uh, as you know, all of us uh, are born from the the multiplication and then differentiation of a single cell. A body like mine has uh, 10 to the 14 uh, cells. And all these cells come from the oocyte of my mother and the spermatozoan from my father. And so it is fantastic to think that uh, after 54 years or so, there is a body composed of so many cells that is here to speak. And uh, it's even more remarkable as uh, uh, it was already um, reported uh, several years ago that uh, after a seemingly miraculous feat of morphogenesis, a complex metazoan should be unable to perform the much simpler task of merely maintaining what is already formed. So it's really fascinating to, to understand why we are not able to survive uh, indefinitely, so to become immortal. And obviously this c brings us uh, uh, to asking uh, uh, how long have we been living as human species, and uh, uh, we are all familiar with this kind of, uh, of a trend charts showing how much life expectancy has increased over the years. A, a person, a, a boy, uh, a, a girl probably was even worse, born under the ancient Romans, uh, had a, a life expectancy of 22 years. So this number obviously is very much marked on the very high perinatal uh, mortality. Then life expectancy increased to 50 years and in the 19th century. 1970 it was 70 years, so we gained 21 years in only 70 years. The beginning of the 2000, it was 76 years. Now there are different statistics. If you look at the bottom one, these are statistics mostly made by the insurance company. The insurance companies are very interested in life expectancy because they want to know how much they should charge you the, 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 the for, for, for life insurance. Uh, in the G7 industrial countries, life expectancy in our days is expected to range from 91 years in Japan and a minimum of 83 years uh, in uh, the USA. The oldest reported uh, uh, person living now, at least last year, was uh, uh, this lady here in Japan who was, uh, we won the, the Guinness for the being the, the most uh, um, elderly uh, person, 114 years old. Which brings us to asking the question, suppose that there is a perfect world where there are no accidents, where there is uh, uh, no infectious disease, where medicine can cure uh, uh, everything, where there is no cancer. Should we live indefinitely? The answer is definitely not. Life expectancy maximum, maximum is uh, um, calculated around 120, 125 years for the uh, human species. The oldest person reported this lady here in France, 122 years. But the most fascinating thing is that uh, there is a fixed term for life expectancy for all the species on the planet. For example, a rat lived three years maximum, a squirrel 25, a sheep 12, a dog, this is a common experience according to the species from 15 to 30 years, a fly three months. So there is a sort of clock and the clock, obviously, is something that must be genetically encoded. Uh, it is a program that is somehow and somewhere in our genes that sets uh, the lifespan for each uh, living being. And I anticipate that we don't know anything about what this clock is, despite this being one of the most uh, fascinating and intriguing questions we might, uh, might ask. You could ask why there is a clock, and here the answer is very simple, uh, because it is uh, evolutionary advantageous. Uh, uh, you should read absolutely this book here, which was published by Richard Dawkins, uh, a very famous uh, evolutionary biologist and, uh, and a fantastic uh, uh, writer for, for uh, uh, the lay public. Uh, and this gene, uh, this, uh, this uh, selfie gene, is uh, one of his masterpieces where he describes evolution not driven by um, uh, bodies, but driven by genes. And once you transmit uh, your genes uh, to your progeny, and you live sufficiently long because your progeny uh, becomes independent on the planet, then immediately you become a competitor for your progeny for accessing the resources. And so uh, natural selection makes a good job in driving you to age and then to die. So getting rid of the bodies that might compete for the resources. What happens during uh, uh, this process of differentiation? Uh, every one of us is born from uh, uh, a cell which is fertilized. We call this the zygote. Then this cell becomes two, 
become four, eight, and then at a certain point in humans is about three, four days after fertilization, this, uh, uh, there are about 150 cells, they form a sphere. This sphere has uh, a cavity inside filled by liquid. This is called the blastocyst. And then uh, this, uh, uh, after the blastocyst, uh, there is a tremendous uh, uh, process uh, by which uh, the cells start to stack into three layers. We call them the three germ layers. And from each of these three layers, uh, all the different tissues in our bodies are formed. In our body, there are more than 240 different uh, uh, cell types that uh, form uh, a few tissues. And these uh, 240 cell types all come from this process, so they are they share the same genetic information as the zygote, but they acquire specific programs. In genetics, specific programs means that uh, all the cells have exactly the uh, 20,000, 25,000 genes, but they express only a minority of these genes, which is about one quarter. And the genes that are expressed in an hepatocyte are different from those that are expressed in a lymphocyte or in a neuro and other cell types. So basically, each of these cells have exactly the same genetic information, but they are programmed to do only one task. And some of them will do this task for the rest of the life. Others can replicate, but they, again, they, their progeny will do the same task for the rest of the life. For example, if you take uh, a, an adult heart and you remove the uh, contrastized cells in the heart, so the cardiomyocytes, you can culture them in the laboratory. We do this continuously. In, uh, in, uh, in the laboratory, these are pictures from, from Lorena Zentilin, who is here in the audience. We culture them. They are beautifully, beautiful brick-shaped cells. They stay in culture. They even contract. You can do a lot of studies on these cells, but they will never replicate. Uh, there is a study which was published uh, in, in Cell by, by a group at the Karolinska Institute a few years ago, 2005, who measured the amount of uh, uh, C14 that was incorporated uh, into the different tissues, in the DNA of different tissues in humans. So you know that uh, in uh, uh, around the 60s, all the big uh, um, uh, nuclear power um, states, so United States, the USSR at the time, but also France, started to deflagrate uh, uh, nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. And this created a tremendous increase in the amount of radioactive uh, isotopes uh, in the atmosphere. Then there was a treaty signed that stopped uh, all this experimentation. And uh, the radioactivity started to come down. And it is expected that in three or four years, it will return back to basal levels. But this means that uh, uh, since one of the radioactive isotopes is C14, and since all the chemistry of living being is based on carbonium, then the body of each living being on the planet during this period has a certain amount of C14 incorporated in uh, uh, the molecules. If the molecules have a rapid turnover, then the amount of C14 goes down as the uh, time passes. But if they have a slow turnover, then the amount of C14 is the amount that was present in the atmosphere at the moment when the uh, um, cell was born. And applying this kind of uh, measurement of C14 abundance by um, uh, uh, atomic mass spectrometry, basically this group reported that uh, if you take an individual of more than 70 years, they take his heart, uh, in his cardiomyocyte, more than 70% of the cells are exactly those with whom he, he was born, which is fantastic. You think a person who lives 70 years and more than half of the cells in his heart keep beating 72 beats per minute for all throughout the life, but they are exactly the cells that were formed when he was a, 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 a newborn. So you will not be surprised that uh, uh, the uh, uh, m major cause of death of disease in the world are cardiovascular disorders, and that uh, the vast, uh, the major component of these cardiovascular disorders uh, uh, is due to the incapacity of the heart to regenerate itself. So every time a heart cell dies, there is no way of reproducing this cell. Every time that the cell is uh, hit by a virus or because of hypertension, because of an infarction, cells die, there is no way of regenerating the heart. And we will speak later that similar things or even worse occurred for the, for the brain. In the world, there are more than 17 million uh, people dying because of these diseases worldwide, 80% of which are in developing countries. So it means uh, that uh, all over the world, as uh, life expectancy increases, uh, this kind of problem of regeneration becomes the key problem 
of uh, health. And so what we know now is that uh, uh, and the good way of approaching the problem of aging is thinking that basically aging uh, is nothing else than the exhaustion of the regenerative capacity of most organs and tissues after birth. The funny thing is that uh, we became aware of this exhaustion, not all through life, but in a specific window of our life, which is the last 5% uh, of life, which means that, uh, for example, for human beings, a person lives 95% of his time perfectly well, doesn't see a doctor, the, has no health problems, but then suddenly uh, everything starts to occur in the last 5% of years, in the last five years of his life. And it's not surprised that more than 90% of uh, uh, the um, expenses for health in the Western world is spent in the last five years of life of each individual. And so you see that if you take 100 individuals, they are all alive until uh, the uh, end part of their life, and they suddenly disappear. And this is the same for mouse, the same for C. elegans, the laboratory worm, the same even for uh, e uh, yeast cells, which are the simplest unicellular uh, organism. The problem is really dramatic because besides heart failure, 40% of people over 80 years develop Alzheimer in Europe, one out of three after eight years. Diabetes mellitus, uh, 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 which is due to exhaustion of uh, um, beta cells in the pancreas, 50 million persons affected in Europe, 30% uh, of people after 75 and 50% of people after 75 don't see well or don't hear well because retinal cells degenerate and cells in the inner ear degenerate and so basically there is no way of regenerating the cells, there is no way of regenerating the heart, no way of regenerating neurons, no way of regenerating beta cells in the pancreas. So what is the mechanism by which this uh, exhaustion, this uh, incapacity of proliferating and regenerating of cells in the body uh, occurs? And here, over the years, there have been a number, a really huge number of theories uh, uh, exposed. Uh, you know that, that uh, uh, in biology, but in science in general, when there are uh, many theories, uh, most likely none of these uh, is, the, is the right one or the truth is the combination uh, in the combination of those. Uh, and so I won't go into, into this list just to give you an idea of the complexity and the bottom line is that we don't know. We don't know, we don't have an answer to that, but we know some hints here and where which are not necessarily connected but they start progressively connected. So there are some uh, major molecular players that control this process of aging and, uh, and I'm, I'm going to uh, go uh, through uh, some of these uh, in, the, in the next few slides. Something that was uh, uh, already uh, clear uh, almost 50 years ago is that uh, uh, one major problem created to our cells and possibly one source of uh, aging is the fact that uh, in our atmosphere, in our world, we use oxygen to generate energy. So we are um, uh, animals in which the major source to produce energy is the production of AT ATP and the ATP is produced at the expenses uh, of uh, energy. This is a process that occurs in some specific uh, um, organelles inside each cell. These are called mitochondria. They have this form here. They are the result of a symbiont bacteria that has invaded a eukaryotic cell and that has remained there by losing the vast majority of his gene, but being beneficial for the cell because it provides ATP to the cell. There are really millions of these organelles uh, in, in each organ. Look at these are some pictures by, by Julia Watts in the laboratory where she stained the mitochondria into cardiac cells by uh, a, a red staining. You see how many mitochondria are in a cardiac cell. Cardiac cells produce, uh, uh, use a lot of energy. And on the inner member of mitochondria, there is a process that is called oxidative phosphorylation in which basically uh, um, um, electrons are transferred from uh, electron donors to electron acceptors. Uh, there is a flow of electrons, and this flow of electrons uh, creates uh, a gradient of protons, and then this gradient of protons uh, is used by a, a complex uh, which is called ATP synthase, which is a, a rotor motor that uses this uh, uh, gradient in a process called chemiosmosis to generate ATP. And this gradient uh, is uh, maintained the uh, by using uh, atmospheric uh, uh, oxygen. This is a very efficient process, much more efficient than uh, just burning uh, 
um, sugars, but it is a, a process that has uh, some expenses to pay, and one of the expenses is the production of uh, what are called the reactive and oxygen species, which are products like superoxide anion, or hydroxy radical, or hydrogen peroxide, or nitrogen oxide that then reacts with other nitrogen species to produce molecules which are very, very reactive with a very oxidative power towards uh, other molecules. It is calculated that 0 0.2 to 2% of oxygen, which is burned by the mitochondria, doesn't, uh, is not used to produce uh, energy, but is used to generate these reactive oxygen species. And these reactive oxygen species also can come from other sources in the cell, for example, each time a bacteria invades on, on one of our white blood cells, then it uh, engulfs it uh, into uh, a vacuole, and then a, a pump on the membrane of the vacuole, it's called the NADPH oxidase, pumps these uh, 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 radicals inside the vacuole to kill the bacteria. Uh, so already in the 50. Uh, um, Harman proposed what uh, was at that time the free radical theory of aging, by which aging is somehow associated with degenerative diseases because these reactive oxygen species start damaging molecules uh, inside the cells, start damaging proteins, start damaging uh, DNA. And there are a lot of indications that uh, this might hold true also for all species. For example, it is uh, uh, known that uh, uh, over uh, the, the lifespan, even humans, there, is, uh, um, there are mutations in the mitochondria because mitochondria becomes less and less effective, so this 0.22% becomes more and more of uh, uh, ROS production instead of uh, ATP production. Uh, uh, there are even uh, some inherited uh, uh, variants of DNA which are preferentially instead uh, inherited by people who are the centenarians. In, uh, here in Northern Europe, uh, there is a big cohort of centenarians that have been studied, and uh, these appear to uh, have uh, DNA variants in mitochondria, which uh, somehow slow down uh, uh, oxygen consumption or uh, production. And then what's interesting is also you can uh, take, uh, for example, mice, a substitute a mitochondrial gene with an ineffective mitochondrial gene, by which the mitochondria of this mouse are not uh, more efficient in producing uh, energy, and they produce a lot of reactive oxygen species, and these mice, one of the major phenotypes of these mice, is to age very, very uh, quickly. Even in the worm, uh, the, this mutant here is called ISP1, lives very long, and uh, it has a mutation in one of the proteins of this uh, respiratory chain for oxidative phosphorylation. That's also another mutant. This is a MEV1. This is again a warm uh, mutant in which uh, there is increased generation of, of uh, ROS, and these uh, warm live uh, little. Uh, two mutants in Drosophila. This is just to show that this is very consistent all through evolution. These are two very interesting mutants. This was called Indy. I'm not dead yet. This, this mutant has a 50% increase in lifespan which means that if for a human, it would be like living 180 years, for example. And uh, this Indy protein codes for a protein that uh, uh, is uh, involved in metabolism in the mitochondria. This is another mutant in Drosophila that calls Methuselah, Methuselah. This has a 25% increase in lifespan. Again, this uh, is a mutant of a gene that is uh, uh, codes for a subunit of this uh, rotor pump, the ATP synthase that uh, codes, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, generates uh, ATP. And this uh, has generated a lot of interest because uh, there are ways to prevent uh, uh, oxidative damage. And these way, uh, ways are to uh, take, to intake uh, antioxidants. There have been very, very numerous trials uh, for, to prevent damage in the cardiovascular system, in the eye, or uh, in the brain by the uh, assumption of vitamin E, ubiquinone, and uh, uh, in acetyl cysteine, and so on, with very controversial results. Pay very attention before taking antioxidants. There has been, been uh, a paper published uh, last week, actually, showing that uh, it is true that antioxidants prevent uh, aging, but uh, if you give antioxidants to people, then those who have a tumor, especially a lung tumor, see the tumor growing more rapidly. Uh, because uh, uh, these uh, oxidative species 
are detrimental to tumor growth if you remove them. Also, the tumor cells are more happy, not only the normal cells. So you don't age, but also the tumor cells grow more rapidly. But certainly there is a relationship between ROS uh, and mitochondria, and so we, certainly this is one of the major players. Now, ROS create damage, and they can create damage to proteins, but proteins have a turnover, so they can be produced again, but they can create damage also to DNA. And when the DNA is damaged, then there is a, what's called the DNA damage response, which is elicited in the cell. So a set of proteins that uh, say, oh, pay attention, there is something that doesn't work in the DNA. First thing they do, they stop the cell cycle. They activate, they recognize the damage, they activate some proteins. This is one of the major players, ATM. And this protein activates another protein, which is called P53. And this protein stops the cell cycle, activates repair, and if repair is not possible, uh, brings the cells to program cell death of apoptosis. Uh, this is the same mechanism that uh, has some relationship with uh, the development of cancer. So once DNA is damaged, then if uh, it is not repaired and the cell doesn't die, then a mutation is installed. And now we know that cancer is nothing else than uh, uh, the product of a, a aberrant cell growth due to genetic mutation. So cancer is a somatic genetic disease. And uh, somebody says, uh, the, there's a group in the United States that believes that uh, aging has a selective advantage of preventing cancer by blocking proliferation of cells, you do well to the body because it is true that you bring the cells to age. But at the same time, since the proliferation is stopped, you also don't have cancer. So aging could be the price for uh, tumor uh, suppression. This is a very intriguing, uh, uh, the intriguing uh, uh, theory. It is supported also by the idea that, for example, mortality due to cancer increases uh, over time as uh, uh, aging increases over time. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, obviously several reasons also to dispute this. For example, it doesn't explain why a mouse lives two years and a human 120. So there is uh, no indication that uh, DNA damage is repaired differently or this uh, cell cycle checkpoint, the block progression of the cell cycles or cell replication are much different uh, in the mouse and uh, in uh, humans. And then there are mechanisms that uh, repair DNA damage. And so one should invoke also a deficit of this repair. And indeed it is true that uh, e there are some spontaneous genetic mutations in humans that cause premature aging. And these are genetic mutations that of proteins that are involved in DNA damage sensing and repair. The most famous one is Werner syndrome. Uh, which is a tremendous genetic uh, uh, mutation, a uh, mutation of a single gene that causes premature aging. So this is a, a lady who is uh, 48 years, and you see that uh, it is completely uh, senent senescent. And uh, uh, in uh, about 15 years ago, there has been a, a, a tremendous rush by different genetics laboratories to find what the Werner gene was, and it turned out that it is a gene that is involved in DNA repair. So it is an helicase, an enzyme that uh, uh, binds uh, to damaged DNA, opens it up, and allows it to repair. And the same for other uh, 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 syndrome. For example, this uh, uh, syndrome here, nimegen brekker syndrome, is another of these proteins that recognize uh, damaged DNA, and the phenotype is again aging. So if we are incapable of repairing DNA, uh, the cell stops replicating and the phenotype is aging. So there is a strong correlation between cancer and uh, DNA damage and uh, uh, aging. Another uh, uh, small uh, piece in the puzzle was brought forward uh, again several years ago by a scientist, uh, Ron Heiflick, who in 1965 observed that uh, if you take a cell from a, a young uh, newborn uh, baby or uh, a cell from uh, uh, an old person. So suppose, for example, take a skin biopsy, this is what he did, and put the cells in the biopsy in culture, fibroblast. The uh, cells from the young baby had uh, uh, 50, 60, uh, 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 the capacity for proliferating and duplicating 50, 60 times. While the, person, the, the cell from the old person only replicated uh, one or two times. And this is what is called cellular senescence. So there is a very strong relationship between the capacity of a cell to proliferate 
and the age of the individual from whom the cells has been taken. Uh, uh, the number of division that a cell, different cell type is capable to do is called the Hayflick number, which remained a sort of magical number. Cardiomyocyte, adult cardiomyocyte, for example, have a Hayflick number of zero. They are incapable of division. If I take a fibroblast of myself, it will do 10, 15 divisions at this moment. Until uh, uh, it was discovered that this property is mainly due to the fact that a cell in culture, possibly in vivo, Every time it divides, it shortens the end of the chromosomes. You know that uh, each of our cells contains 23 chromosomes, which are linear structure. 23 comes from our mother, 23 comes from our father. And since they are linear structure, the ends is protected, and is protected by uh, a, a series of repetition of this very simple uh, 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 repeat in, in, in vertebrates, TTA, GGGG, which, which is... Uh, <coughs> repeated for several times to form very, very long sequences. And uh, there is a special enzyme in the cell that uh, keeps these sequences uh, uh, the same length when the cell replicates. But in adult individuals, this enzyme, which is called the telomerase, is switched off. So every time a cell divides, it erodes part of these uh, sequences. And uh, three scientists uh, in 2009 won the Nobel Prize for having uh, discover this mechanism. Uh, these were Elizabeth Blackburn, Carl Greider, and Jack Stostak. And basically, one of the things that they discovered is that uh, this erosion is very different in normal cells, uh, which age, in tumor cells, or in the germ cells. Germ cells are the immortal cells, so the cells in the ovary that form the oocytes, so the cell in the testes that form the spermatozoan. So here they have a lot of these enzyme telomerase and very long telomeres while aging cells in the body have very short telomeres, and tumor cells, which needs to grow, reactivate telomerase function. People have been trying for 20 years to develop an anti-cancer agent that has as a target telomerase. It would be a perfect target for cancer. Unfortunately, for various reasons, these enzymes, then this enzyme is not suitable for this kind of uh, development. So one model for aging is that basically your telomeres become shorter, and the, when they are so short, the, the cell is incapable of replicating because they are so short that they are recognized as damaged DNA. So they again, they start a DNA damage response. Again, they activate P53. Again, they block proliferation. The end result is uh, uh, aging. Now, this is a, a, a very solid theory, and, uh, and certainly you cannot have replication without telomeres. I personally don't believe this is a, an explanation, uh, because uh, if you knock down telomerase, for example, the enzyme in a mouse, uh, it, 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 it takes uh, five or six generations to see a phenotype. Uh, uh, and so basically only the mouse at the fifth the telomeres are so long that they are eroded every generation, and only the fifth generation develop cancer and uh, is sterile. But all the other generations uh, live two years, so they don't have a shortened lifespan. So there is must something going on beyond telomeres. Whatever the thing, there is much controversy. Some of you must, m could have read in the uh, newspapers uh, b before the end of last year that uh, uh, there are two companies in the world. One, one has been funded by this Elizabeth Blackburn, which is, I mean, uh, also from the ethics point of view, I think this very question whether the Nobel Prize are to do commercial advertisement for a company that measures the length of telomeres in peripheral blood and gives uh, every individual for this cost. Uh, the other company is in the UK for, so from, from a cost around 400 uh, uh, pounds, the prediction of how much is left for him or for her to live. So this is a prediction of lifespan just by taking, by taking blood. There is absolutely no indication that there is a true correlation with uh, lifespan. Uh, it might be a very weak and broad correlation with the status of health of that individual. Certainly telomeres are an important players in this game. But the, the we are coming to the most interesting things and the most uh, newer things. Uh, the idea that uh, there must be some gene programs. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's take social insects, uh, 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 bees, for example. Uh, queens and workers have come exactly from the ca same kind of fertilized eggs. They have the same mother, the same father, exactly the same genetic information. 
But if you are born as a worker, then you will live a few weeks in the summer, a few months in winter. If you are born as a queen, you live several years. So from the same genetic information, there are two kinds of genetic programs. There are some animals, for example, turtles, deep water fishes, or the, 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 the lobster that lives uh, um, around the coast of, uh, of, uh, of New England or Maine, the one that we used to eat when we go to Boston for meetings. These uh, age very, very slowly. So they have a life expectancy of 120, 200 years. And the hallmarks of these animals is that they don't have a fixed mass body. So while we reach our maximum body size at around 18 years old, and then we remain on that side all throughout our life, these animals continue to grow, which is again an indication that there must be some correlation with the capacity of tissues to uh, grow and so to repair themselves. So if you need to grow, there must be cells that are capable of proliferation. There are some other uh, animals that are very interesting. For example, one of the most interesting animals is the Pacific Salmon. They are called also the Big Bang animals. Pacific Salmon is born in a certain place uh, uh, on the mountains of Canada, for example. They go uh, down the river, they reach the ocean, they live in the ocean all through uh, their life and until something happens, a sort of bell rings in their brain by which they start going back on the same rivers where they have been uh, uh, generated. And they go thousands of kilometers up these rivers. Probably you have seen uh, documentaries showing bears capturing these salmons as they jump uh, 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 vertically on the top of, 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 of waterfalls. So an ener enormous expenditure of energy. They arrive in the same places where they were generated. The female deposes uh, her eggs, the male the sperm, fertilization occurs, and then they die. They immediately die. Because they have assault their gene transfer uh, uh, mission, and they don't need to take care of the progeny because the progeny is independent, so there is no need for them to remain alive. Another very strong indication that uh, evolution is driven by genes and that uh, the soma is very, very dispensable. So there must be genetic programs for these. And so people started to look for genetic, genetic programs. And the first, uh, uh, there being a collection of genes that decrease lifespan. You don't need to read these. These are all genes that, uh, if are mutated in the mouse, they decrease lifespan. Uh, most of these genes are genes in the DNA repair and DNA recognition pathways, again, indicating this is a major thing. But the most interesting things thing is, uh, the, was the discovery of uh, animals that live significantly longer. For example, there are two species of mice, and these are not generated in the laboratory. They are normal mice that were uh, generated uh, uh, by chance. They are called the Ames and Snell dwarf mice. So they are mice that are, remain very, very small. And it was noticed that uh, these mice live significantly longer. Another mouse is the little mice. Uh, 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 in, uh, in these other knockout mice. And it was discovered that all the mutation in this pathway here very significantly increase lifespan. And this is the pathway of a growth factor that uh, in humans have two uh, species. One is insulin, and the other is another factor which is called the insulin-like growth factor. They both bind the receptor. By binding the receptor, they cause receptor phosphorylation. Phosphorylation of the receptor recruits uh, some protein in the cytoplasm. These proteins uh, activate uh, a signal transducer in, uh, again, the cytoplasm. It's called PI3 kinase, and this PI3 kinase activates another kinase, and this kinase again phosphorylated factor, which drives a genetic program. Each of the mutation in the receptor, in the signal transducers, or in this pathway here, or in this transcription factor here, create animals that have two characteristics. One is to live longer. Some of these animals live three, four times. So for, for it would be like for us living almost 500 years. And the second characteristic is that they are all very small. Uh, uh, look at the title of this review, which uh, gives you a feeling for this. Uh, healthy aging is smaller, better. So uh, basically, if you keep body size small, if you decrease uh, the expenditure for metabolism, if you decrease the amount of food, if you decrease uh, all the metabolic pathways, then you can live much longer. 
Then, and this is the final piece of evidence, even more exciting than this, this came from another screen for mutants, this time in East. And it was discovered the protein, which is called CIR2, which, uh, uh, upon which, uh, the deletion of which is very significantly increases uh, lifespan. One say, okay, it is in East, but then the, there is a mutant, uh, there is a protein which is very similar in the worm, and again, if you uh, uh, mutate, uh, uh, sorry, if you uh, uh, overexpress this protein in worms, uh, then uh, uh, the lifespan increases. Uh, uh, and then this protein was discovered to be present in all uh, the species, uh, uh, including humans. We have seven variants of this protein, so the overexpression of which increases lifespan. So if you knock down the protein, animals live much less. At the same time, there was a, a sort of paradox in the uh, food research field. And so uh, several years ago, this is uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, it was noted that if you do a very simple uh, plot in which uh, you plot uh, the death rate against the amount of cholesterol that uh, is assumed with diet, uh, uh, then there is a, a very strong relationship. We know that uh, we shouldn't uh, eat uh, very much cholesterol, but there were some exceptions. For example, one was uh, uh, Finland, in which there was much more death even compared to food. Actually, Finland, from the, 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 the time when this data was published, started a health uh, uh, control program in the country by which now uh, they have uh, um, lowered these percentages to uh, the, those of other countries simply by uh, sensitizing the populations against the damage of eating too much uh, fat. But the other exception was France. France had a, a food with a lot of uh, uh, fat, think uh, foie gras, think at uh, uh, the, the, the um, cheese that they eat, but still they lived, they had much less death, and this was called the French paradox. And the French uh, started to say, okay, uh, this is because we uh, drink French wines. Everybody laughed at the beginning, uh, uh, then it was noted that there was a correlation with wine drinking, but not with all wines and not with spirits. It was only red wine. And so and the wines uh, didn't need to be French, obviously, but there was a strong correlation with uh, red wines. And it was discovered uh, that uh, the uh, envelope of red grapes contain a substance, contains several substances that have a collective uh, anti ross activities, antioxidant activities that are called the flavonoids. And one of the flavonoids in particular was resveratrol, which is this very small uh, uh, molecule. And uh, it was discovered that resveratrol is a very strong activator of this uh, sear protein. And that was really uh, astounding. And uh, uh, this, uh, David Sinclair, who made the discovery in Harvard, uh, funded a company who, uh, uh, after two years, I think, uh, from funding, was sold to GSK for uh, uh, $720 million for the patent uh, for this uh, discovery. This is uh, usually cited as one of the most, uh, 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 most, most successful examples of uh, startups uh, uh, all over the world. And the reason why there is so much interest in it is because uh, resveratrol now moves uh, a market uh, as a, an oral supplement, a diet, dietary supplement of uh, uh, several tens of million dollars every year. So there are a lot of people uh, taking resveratrol as a supplement uh, as an eating aging uh, agent. It is, there is very much debate on what is the mechanism of resveratrol function if uh, it is only by activating these uh, sear proteins or this family of sear to proteins. There could be other mechanisms, but uh, there are indications that uh, resveratrol is, uh, uh, prevents uh, aging basically in all uh, species, uh, including rodents. Uh, a paper last year came out that uh, the major function of uh, 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 resveratrol is to activate the human homologous SIR2, it's called SIR2-1, which activates uh, a transcription factor, which is called PGC1-alpha, that. Uh, uh, in turn uh, uh, activates transcription of a lot of genes uh, which uh, reduce ROS in the mitochondria and improve mitochondrial function. So there is also a biochemical ration that links ROS production with activity of CIRT1 and resveratrol that activates CIRT1. Uh, uh, in this paper, uh, uh, it was also funny because, uh, funny, it was also interesting because it was found that one of the activators of CIRT1 besides resveratrol is this enzyme here, which is called the AMP, 
kinase and GAS, which is the best activator known of AMP kinase. This is a, a protein, an enzyme that is the target of the major efforts by all the big pharmaceutical companies. If somebody found, finds a a, an activator AMP kinase, then this would be very, very interesting. It was discovered that the best activator of this kinase is aspirin. And it won't be surprising that uh, the last five years there are clinical trials showing that aspirin not only inhibits uh, uh, um, cardiovascular disorder because of this uh, antiplatelet aggregation effect, but it also it decreases the percentage of cancer and it does a lot of other uh, benefits. Uh, and so certainly the fifth player in this is cell, is cell uh, metabolism. Uh, and obviously, uh, this is, a, uh, I understand this is a, a, a sort of patchy picture, so it's uh, very pixelated even here. There are not everything is connected, but this is a state of the art, so this is what we know. And obviously, uh, the, the, the major aim for this is to uh, say, okay, we know this evidence, well, what can we do out of this? Uh, what can we do? And this is not a, a, a new question because this has been basically the question of humanity. Uh, remember, the, the, there are myths of the uh, elixir of life, uh, or the philosopher's stone, uh, or the fountain of immortal life. This is one of the most famous, uh, the most famous uh, uh, legends. Uh, the legend says that uh, one of the sailors, the captains that went with uh, uh, Christopher Columbus uh, to the Americas, uh, uh, was uh, Juan Ponce de Leon, and then uh, once they reached America, he departed from um, uh, Columbus and started uh, uh, to travel, to, to sail in the southern part of the Americas where Florida is now. And then uh, uh, at a certain point he discovered some islands which correspond to the, the uh, Biminis, when uh, the legend says that he found uh, a spring uh, uh, in which if you drink that water of the spring, then uh, this comfort uh, the eternal life. And this was, on, was one of the declination of this uh, sort of uh, aspiration of human being to remain immortal. What can we do today? Well, we can take resveratrol. I do that. Uh, aspirin is very good, but pay very attention to take aspirin. Don't do that without a medical prescription and under medical surveillance because this, uh, it can create serious uh, problems of bleeding and serious problems uh, to your uh, stomach. If you tolerate a small amount of, uh, of aspirin, that uh, uh, would be an interesting possibility. All the agents that increase, decrease inflammation, so again aspirin, but also other non-steroidal uh, non drugs are helpful because inflammation, you remember the bacteria which is engulfed and uh, uh, there is a lot of production of ROS, but if you do act with anti-inflammatory drugs, then you reduce uh, this uh, uh, capacity of producing, uh, 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 of producing uh, ROS. This is more or less what you can find, except for one thing, which is the most effective at all, and this is caloric restriction. If you take a diet, which is 70% of what you would eat uh, ad libitum, so what the tables say that you should eat according to your body composition, then in all animals that are submitted to this kind of diet, they live very significantly uh, longer. If you start eating 60-70% of what you would eat, then uh, uh, there is a, an acute phase, which is uh, terrific apparently to to accept, but then uh, this is followed by an adaptive period of several weeks, and then you reach a, a very stable, altered state in which uh, body temperature is lower, there is much less glucose in the blood, and obviously you have reduced fat and weights, and these animals submitted to caloric restriction are uh, more uh, resistant to all stressors. So, for example, they uh, have less cancer, they are less susceptible to uh, inflammation. Last year, uh, oh, sorry, three years ago, a trial started of two years, so it finished uh, last year. In the United States, it was called Calorie, in which they took uh, a large number of people, of young people, and asked them to uh, be subject to this kind of restriction for uh, um, about two years, and only, I think, 10% of these were uh, succeeded to cope with this kind of regimen. So it's very difficult to accept this. But in all animals, in, in all species in which caloric restriction was tested, there was a significant increase in lifespan. This is true for the, the, the fly, it's true for the worm, it's true for mice, but it's even true for, it's even true for monkeys. For example, look at uh, uh, survival simply. Mortality of monkeys sub sub subject 
to caloric restriction. This is a normal mortality over age, and this is a mortality of a calorically restricted uh, animals. And, uh, 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 and these are the percentage of animals without age-related diseases. You see that this is the control, so uh, uh, monkeys start to age and they develop symptoms, and this is how the symptoms are developed in the calorically restricted animals. The other thing that we can do, and this is more on the medical side, we try, can try to repair the damages that have suffered. So if uh, I suffer a damage in the heart, then I can try to repair the heart. And the best way to do is to go back in, in uh, what uh, development has produced, so to go back to embryonic cells. So if you take the blastocyst, you remember the 150 cells uh, sphere, you dissolve the blastocyst, then you can culture cells which are embryonic stem cells, and these cells can be grown in several billions in the laboratory and convinced to become any cell types virtually. We can convince them to become hard cells, and for example, we can take these hard cells and in the laboratory and they start to, these are uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, convinced to become cardiomyces, and they start uh, beating synchronously. Beating synchronously is a hallmark to say these are real hard cells because this is a property only of hard cells. So this is a pacemaker and then all the cells beat synchronously. If you take these cells and put it in into a myocardial infarct to repair the heart, they completely regenerate the heart. Uh, this requires, however, that we have a no-site and a sperm, and you need to create a blastocyst. And people who are religious believe that the blastocyst is potentially a new individual, so they are very much against this. There are there other ways to create these embryonic stem cells. Well, one way it was uh, taught us by Jan Wilmut with the generation of Dolly the sheep. Basically, what Wilmut did was... Uh, to take uh, a cell, in his case from the sheep, in our case from a patient, for example, a cell from the skin, take the nucleus of these cells and put the nucleus uh, into an egg which has previously devoided of his nucleus. For some reasons, this process, which is called uh, cloning by nuclear transfer, uh, uh, rendered this nucleus believing that he is an embryonic cell and not uh, a differentiated cell, and so this starts to divide and becomes a blastocyst, and then you can repeat the procedure. Catholic people say, okay, again, you create a blastocyst, so this is not good. You don't need an egg, sorry, you don't need to do in vitro fertilization, but you still need the blastocyst. And things changed in 2006, because a group in Japan, the group uh, uh, leader was uh, um, um, Senor Yamanaka, uh, again taught us how to obtain embryonic stem cells without uh, an embryo. So basically, the fibroblast is simply transfected by four genes, uh, these four factors, which convert this cell into uh, a cell which is functionally equivalent to an embryonic cell, and this can be expanded and implanted. This is uh, much easier to draw, much more difficult to do, but uh, in a, a couple of months, in spring, in Japan, the first experimentation for regeneration based on this kind of cells will start in an attempt to regenerate the retina. The other, oh, last week, somebody of you must have seen in Nature two very exciting papers showing that you don't even need these four factors. You just take the fibroblast, put it in low pH, 5.7 pH for 30 minutes, and you obtain an embryonic stem cell. If this is true, then this will really change the regeneration field. The other thing you can do is to do what we try to do in the laboratory, that is to try to convince the cells of the organs to regenerate endogenously. We have found some small genetic material, some microRNAs, that once injected in the heart, convince the heart to replicate. This is a left ventricle, you see, with a normal left ventricle of a heart, and this is another heart which was injected. You see how bigger is this, because the cells here have proliferated. Uh, I don't want to go into detail because uh, I, I promise I, I wouldn't have spoken about my research uh, uh, specifically in this. I just want to end up with a, a sort of ethical remark. Are we sure we want to do this? Because clearly, uh, extending lifespan and health of organs or repairing organs by the use of stem cells or convincing organs to regenerate will make us live longer or at least will allow us to reach this 120 threshold. But let us not forget that uh, we are born with about uh, 
uh, according to, to people, uh, from 20 to 100 billion neurons. And we lose uh, something in the order of uh, 80,000, 100,000 neurons uh, every day. So as I'm here speaking to you and as you are listening to me, you are losing uh, hundreds uh, or thousands uh, of neurons. And uh, 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 let's not forget that uh, already there are six, seven million people affected by dementia in the Western Europe. And you see that uh, the proportion of people with dementia increases dramatically with uh, the extension of uh, lifespan. Uh, dementia is nothing else uh, of, of the loss of neurons from the brain. I don't know if some of you have seen a, 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 an MRI scan or a, a tax or CT scan of a brain of a person with Alzheimer or a functional imaging. Uh, the simple, the brain is empty, it's empty of cells. The cells have, uh, have died more rapidly than in other individuals. So the great risk that uh, we are uh, uh, running here is to learn how to prolong life of our somas, not learning how to prolong life of our brain. And it is very difficult to think that we will be able to repair the brain because you can uh, conceive to repair the heart by putting some stem cells that have become cardiomyocytes. The heart is a sort of stupid muscle that pumps. But neurons take uh, several years to form connections. So think uh, the kind uh, of cognitive uh, capacity of a newborn baby compared to an adult individual. It takes 18 years uh, to reach completion or so. And this complexion is made of connection. It's possible to me, at least in this moment, to think that we can inject a, 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 a neuron deriving from a stem cell in the brain and repair this connection. We cannot conceive even to put a neuron in the spine and think that will generate the axon that reaches a muscle a dozens of centimeters away. So the risk that we are running here is to create a society which is uh, in which there are uh, plenty of very well-functioning soma in which people are really dement. Uh, and with this, uh, I stop. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.